Okay, welcome back to this final part of the Diverse Ed virtual conference, the fifth one in the series. We've had a wonderful um, morning listening to our guests, um, and I think it's now time for our reflections. So, Hannah, what did you make of our speakers today and, and, and the sort of messages that were coming out? Well, firstly, it was great to hear some new voices and see some new faces. Um, we've got a big diverse network between us, but it can feel like sometimes we've got the same people talking about the same issues so I think it's great just to have some some new people join us um it really made me think about the fact that we know that some of the critique around diversity is that it's it's soft um and it can be storytelling and the storytelling is really powerful but what I think what really really resonated with me today was the data and the story the data tells us and what data are we all using to anchor our articulation of DEI but what data is also missing? Um, and I know that we've talked about one of the future things for Diverse Ed is that we, we want to create a space for people doing their, their masters, their MPQs, their doctorates, looking at DEI. How can we bring them together and network them and, and help to amplify some of their research? So that, that's kind of what my key takeaway is at the moment. Um, how about you? I think it was really interesting, actually, and staying on the idea of statistics and, and the question that I asked about where to find this information, because, you know, we want to have that kind of solid base of research and, and evidence behind what we're talking about. So you don't get those accusations of, you know, fluffiness and, oh, it's only about lived experience, you know, as ridiculous as that uh, statement is. Uh, and actually the fact that there isn't a central place to be able to get that st those statistics. You've got lots of organisations creating uh, studies, and, and doing that research but it's all held in silo um, and uh, you know one of the kind of hopes that I have is that Diverse Ed will be a space um, where we can start to collate some of that information uh, so that it's at it's updated and it's um, at your fingertips. Um, so if you do have to have the argument about, you know, um, the impact on mental health of um, homophobia, you, you've got your statistics there. But I think the other thing that came out today um, as well was this idea, you know, like you said, the storytelling aspect of it. And I really want to come back to this idea that storytelling isn't fluffy. Storytelling is something that we use as human beings to create the narrative around the world that we live in. Um, and it helps us remember, it helps us feel placed. Um, and, you know, I think some people are very dismissive of the idea of storytelling as this kind of, you know, and oral history as being something that's perhaps not as rigorous as something that's in a textbook. But uh, I think what we're hearing from our teachers and our guests and our students is that storytelling is the absolute mainstay of this work um, in all of its forms. Um, and so certainly, you know, that's something that I think needs capturing in some way. And, and just to add about the data, so if the audience aren't aware, um, Edurio, um, E-D-U-R-I-O, have recently done the biggest data collection of the school system to date. Um, and they are in the process of writing up their report and that's going to be published on June the 21st. And there's an event that you can come to um, and you can use their survey to gather the sense of belonging for the staff in your school. Um, so there are tools out there that can help you do that. And I think going back to the, the storytelling, it's us all thinking about who we're giving the mic to as well. And I think Temi's, Temi's point about making space, again, is something I constantly think about. So, I mean, I know we both challenge the events that are lacking diverse lineups. Sometimes I just say no, but then I, I get replaced by another white straight woman. So then I say yes, but would you like some help? And I'm constantly in this ongoing email or phone tussle with organisations, but but we need more people to be doing that. Please don't just say yes to an event without asking who else is speaking. Um, I got published on an event this week that I'd said yes to tentatively and they put it out live without actually running the, the list of other speakers out to me. And, like, and that's problematic, that compromises me. So I want us all to think about, Sharifa talked about spheres of influence, thinking about how you can flex your spheres of influence on the tables you sit at, about whose voice is being heard at those tables. Can you extend that table? Can you just work the dynamic in that space um, as well? Any other any other thoughts from you, Benny, about your reflection? I was just coming back to something Jill was saying around uh, recruitment and representation, you know, and, and that real fear that I think schools have that, you know, if they tap people on the shoulder, somehow they're being unfair um, or not following procedures. But I, I do think there is a, like I said, there's an equity level issue here 
that sometimes there are people from protected characteristics who uh, come from underrepresented backgrounds in senior leadership who do need a tap on the shoulder um, to be told that they have potential because perhaps they haven't heard that before. Um, and so, you know, my my pledge as a leader is going to be very much around how I mentor not just outside of school, but inside of school and talk to my um, staff with protected characteristics about potential um, and what that means. And that can come through coaching and that can come through informal corridor conversations. Um, but it's certainly something that I think I need to do more and say, well, no, actually, you will you will bring something to the table. You may not have considered applying for this job, but will you? And, and I can do that without prejudice if I'm not on a panel and, and, and that kind of thing. So uh, certainly, you know, when we come think about everybody else else's pledges that's mine did you have a, a pledge of your own well I just want to pick up what you're saying there because one of my proudest moments this week was the fact that I hosted some training and one of my speakers was an NQT five years ago when I met him Manny and I met him because he came on the DFE diversity equality grant that we I won and you guys were part of the contribution of it and I met this amazing group of 80 school leaders or aspiring school leaders who were who were from diverse backgrounds and to see the journey he's been on and how he can map back his milestones to those funded opportunities. Um, I just want to spotlight to the audience that in the last few weeks, um, the Diversity Roundtable that we co-convene um, has publicly um, published the letter we wrote to the DfE on, the, on March the 1st. I've been told multiple times by the DfE they're going to respond. They haven't yet. I let them know a courtesy. We were going to publish it live. Please find it. It's on the website. Have a look at it. That's a, a group of organisations outlining their concerns to the DfE about the lack of funding. And I think Manny's story is the example of the difference that funding makes. We also know the pledge has gone for women in, women in education. Um, also this week, um, the NGA and um, ISBL, which is the School Business Leaders Association, have recirculated the updated pledges for a number of organisations for diversity, equity and inclusion. So I, I just want to make sure that people have these things on their radar. And I guess my, my pledge is that I'm going to carry on amplifying the the aff the affirmation the good work the storytelling the impact um and making sure that we're creating these spaces um for other people to share their stories as well so my question benny is what's on the horizon what's in the future where do you want to share any updates about the book or about you or about next year so there's so much going on. It's uh, I, I keep saying that I'm flying by the seat of my pants, and I think we both are in in many ways. But the um, we got our 100th contributor uh, submission in for the Diverse Educators Manifesto book. Um, so now we're in editing stages and our team has been absolutely fantastic. Um, the dialogue has been really, really interesting. And, and, you know, for me, I kind of see that book as um, the kind of book that when you're starting out teaching will give you such an insight into uh, diversity, equity and inclusion work, um, you know, even before you get into the classroom. And I think that's the kind of hope that that's the hope that I have about it. Um, next week, I will be presenting evidence to the all party parliamentary group for Africa um, around um, the curriculum um, and particularly on representation of Af Africa, Africans and their diaspora, uh, which is quite exciting. Um, and there's lots of mini training events coming. I'm doing a lot of training at the moment and there's some really brilliant con uh, conversations happening um, around curriculum work. Uh, so those are next steps for us. And still, still attempting to write the diversity in the curriculum book, which apparently is due out in April next year. We'll, we'll see. And to be a deputy head full time and planning a wedding, Benny. I, I, don't, I don't know where you actually sleep. Um, on things on the horizon, um, my end. So we're almost at 150 blogs being published, which I think is really exciting that we've given space for those new voices to emerge. Um, and lots of people have asked about the Diverse Ed podcast, which is on the list, hopefully for September. Um, over the summer, we'll be curating the events for next year. So we really, really hope that we can move back to face-to-face -to -face events. Um, there'll be a call out through the newsletter for speakers for next year, but also for hosts. So we'd love to have a couple of events around the country. And if you are up for being a host of a face-to-face -face event, Leeds Beckett are definitely on my list. We've tried to go there for the last two summers, but we'd love some schools around the country to offer to host us. Um, and if you do read our pledge for the NGA, you'll see that one of the things we've pledged to do is to launch the National Diversity in Education Awards. Um, we There are a lot of awards that happen and there's some great diversity awards that happen cross sector, but we really think there's a gap 
for us to celebrate the fantastic work of DEI in schools. So watch this space. Um, conversations are happening and hopefully there'll be a date and more information for you all very soon. So can we say thank you very much um, for joining us for our fifth Diverse Ed event. This time last year, we had 13 and a half thousand viewers, not quite as high the numbers this afternoon because we are allowed out and you're probably all in the garden having a gin and tonic, which is where I'm going to be shortly. Um, but thank you for joining us. The recording will go on the website in the next week. Um, and please feel free to share and amplify as widely as you can. Thank you, everybody. It's been an absolute pleasure and I hope to see you all again soon.